I want to introduce our first of a few panels, this one on higher education in the era of change. Um, we're going to go for about 40 minutes. Um, I'll do brief introductions, but the bios are in um, your packet today. Let me also um, reiterate that we are going to be going all afternoon. So if you need to take a break, you're on your own. Um, if you need water, it's in the back of the room. There's a, there's a vessel there and cups. You can find your own, all right? Um, uh, so this panel consists of some really smart people. And I'm gonna start in the middle with Dr. Karen An Hunter Anderson. Karen is the executive director of the Illinois Community College Board. Thanks for being with us, Karen. And Dr. Doug Baker, president of Northern Illinois University. You've exported some of your talent to Denver, we see, and yeah. probably a lot of other places as well. Thank you for being here. Dr. Brian Harris is the superintendent of High School District 220. Thank you for being with us, Brian. And Dr. David Sam, president of Elgin Community College, also with us. And Jim Applegate, we've got staying with us, and, and Jim, it will be useful for you to be involved in this dialogue as well as you've already demonstrated for us. Um, so, so Dr. Grismer has brought us uh, the, the issues, I think, and they're very challenging ones, very intriguing uh, conversation you started here, doctor, about national higher education issues, and, and we want to have you guys help us pull them apart and start a dialogue, okay? So we've, we've asked you if, if you could, maybe just a few minutes to start us off. Um, what, are, what are the kinds of the, the impacts on higher education that we've heard presented? Which ones should Harper focus on and why in the next five years? And I'll go, to, if you don't mind, do you want to just go in the order I introduced you? Karen, are you willing to kick us off? Start for a few minutes, each of you, and then we'll start to get a dialogue going with the audience. Karen. I'd like to start out by thanking Ken and Rick for inviting me here today. And to give you kudos, I've got a secret to share with you. And I feel very comfortable sharing this with Dr. Son in the room as well, because I get a lot of questions from uh, the media, from the legislators, from the governor's office, from national organizations about, and, and the question always goes like, this. In Illinois, you have 48 colleges. Which one is best at ABUC? And now there's always an issue. And with 48 colleges, I try to spread it around a little bit because, uh, you know, as the guest speaker said, uh, they're all unique, but they all have strengths of their own. But over and over again, one of the colleges that I always mention is, well, Harvard does that well. Harvard College does that well. And I feel comfortable saying that sitting next to Dr. Sun because one of the other colleges I often refer to as the best <coughs> in certain areas of Belgium. So, so kudos to you for your strategic planning. And now one of the things I'm going to say when they say, which college is the best in strategic planning? All back on Harvard. Uh, but regarding some of the comments that, that uh, uh, Dr. Griesmeier said, uh, I think it gets back to some of the things that the Harper needs to follow the direction you've been going, and that is you really need to look at that culture of evidence as opposed to the culture of belief. And it seems to me like that's one of the things that you've done. You recognize the value of the data, and you're looking, you, we all have a gut feeling of this is the way it is, and this, you know, students do better when they do this, or students do better in this environment. But we've got to move away from that because sometimes that gut feeling isn't true, it may be true in isolated incidents, but it's not true across the board. So I think you need to focus on that culture shift um, that I see going on in a lot of colleges and universities, and that is one of moving away from that Uh, the, the speaker also talked about disruptive innovations. And I think for a community college like Harper, 
Um, those are really advantages in some cases. They are things that we can build on. Uh, I know many of you have probably heard uh, Kevin Carey speak or have heard him interviewed recently. He's the one who wrote about the University of Everywhere. Or, yes, the University of Everywhere. And I really think the community colleges have embraced a lot of that because of our accessibility, because of our uh, movement toward, you know, we're, uh, our, our availability to students in all sectors, uh, students of all types, and that we build upon, upon that. Um, he talked about the, uh, you know, the a balance in the economy of the workforce. And he's correct, we've moved from uh, manufacturing decades and decades ago to back in the 80s and 90s, more of a service industry, and now we've reached uh, a balance of both of those sectors. We've got white collar and blue collar, and um, I think I've heard people say this before, maybe it was Jim who said it's not the white collar, blue collar, it's the white collar, and many of you are sure have heard that as well. But we do provide, Harvard needs to provide students with what they need and what they need to, where, why, how they need to get there. Uh, we have had a, a focus, a wonderful focus, uh, in the last year or so on community colleges nationwide. And uh, it's much appreciated and it's, you know, many of us have been feeling it's about time we get some recognition for the good things that we do. Um, and, I can, and I think one of, there are a number of reasons for that, and Harper is a good example of those. One, we have a new profound respect in our, our culture in the United States for uh, middle skill jobs. And we're not just looking at uh, you know, education, higher education in general, but we're looking at where it leads to. And we have, we have moved from thinking that auto mechanic is somebody who works in his uncle's garage and has grease under his fingernails to someone who is highly skilled and, and knows a lot more about technology and computers and uh, mechanics and engineering and everything than I ever will know. And so I have a respect for that and I think a lot of people in the country have been in respect for that as well. Um, in fact, you know, I'm so respectful of it that I refer to myself sometimes as an education mechanic because I fix things. And I, you know, that may, there was one time when for a highly educated person that might have been an insult, but it isn't anymore. Uh, and we've also heard um, how the world is flat. And that's an opportunity for Harper as well. When you have, when you want to globalize your campus, when you want to uh, move toward a, a larger world of opportunities for your students and for your employers, when you can take advantage of technology and of the, the flow of information to reach a wider variety of students and a wider uh, scope of students. And I think that's, uh, that's crucial. We also see the value of education change, and I think we spoke um, very eloquently about It's a, it's 
very important because we know now that in Illinois, on average, a student who completes a community college degree will make over a half a million dollars additional income in their lifetime. And if they, if they complete a part of the degree, they have a 40 or 28% that of a climbing wall. Doug, we're going to come to you. Give me the top three things you think that Harper needs to take from Dr. Brisman's, Brisman's uh, presentation. Great. And I'll, I'll just start by saying thank you, Ken, for inviting me. It's a real honor and privilege to be here. And uh, I'm closing in on the end of my second year. And uh, I've been out and, and met a lot of people in the state. And Ken has really stood out as a thought leader. And I uh, mm -hmm. really appreciate you jousting with me back and forth. We've had great conversations about the future of education, the future of Illinois, so thank you. And uh, I'm really impressed by what you're doing here. Um, well, uh, one addition, as I get to those three, to yeah. Jim's model is that uh, I, I really like the wheel that he had and all mm -hmm. those change elements. One that I would add maybe to the wheel that's been driving the speed of its turn is uh, the reduction in state support for public institutions that wasn't on the wheel. It's probably the major driver forcing tuition up in public institutions, not climbing walls. But in okay. Illinois, we've lost about 20% of our state funding in the last decade. And that's led to the relatively easy solution of increasing tuition, which has put up access barriers, which has led to reductions in enrollment and all kinds of other right. problems. So we're at a nexus where we can't do that anymore. And so we've got to think about how do we bring more resources in on the revenue side and reduce our costs on the other side. Uh, one, one additional piece I would say is that uh, I, uh, information is easier to get access to. Uh, commoditization was a term Jim used. Uh, we've had easy access to information for a long time, though. That's what libraries have been for a few hundred, few thousand years. But 
they're a lot, it's a lot easier to get now. You know, I, we can all look up at dinner who, you know, who sang that song and figure out who it was and if they're still alive and whatever else we want to figure out. Uh, but teachers have always played that important role of taking information to knowledge and wisdom and application. And uh, as the internet and uh, our pedagogies get better online, that's going to uh, continue to be a disruptive force. So uh, we need to look at the markets. I think Jim was exactly right. We need to look at markets and see what we need. And, and when we think about markets, we have both ends. So in higher education, community college, or four-year schools, we've got incoming students, and we've got the market that they're going into, and we've got to look both directions. So one thing I would suggest to Harper is to have the problem-sensing tools to look up and down. And I really like your ambassador program. That makes a lot of sense, but it's looking back into your supply chain, right? Yep. Uh, you could look out into where your students are going, as the law example was, Jim. Awesome. Uh, and have your ambassadors out at your top 10, 50 employers, whatever you want to do, and bring that back in so you've got real intelligence up, up and down. Uh, another uh, place I might suggest, and something Ken and I have talked about over time, is that um, in America, only a portion of students coming out of high schools or in high schools graduate, and maybe Brian can talk a little bit about this, but only, what, less than half in the country are ready for college or career upon graduation, something like that. We're losing half the market, so why is that? How do we go back through K-12 into birth to K and strengthen the pipeline so we don't lose half of our potential students who are going to go on to live better lives through colleges and universities? So I, I think that partnership uh, with community colleges and universities back into the K-12 system and working on that pipeline and the toxic environment that it lays in, and that toxic environment's often called poverty and how that drives students leaking all the way out. We wouldn't design an education system the way we've des it's acting in America. We wouldn't say, kids from birth to K, we're going to ignore you, even though we know brain development uh, is important and, and social skills, et cetera. We're not, and then we'll put you in school districts that um, often have quality, well, they're funded by tax bases. And if you're in a poor district, you may have less resources. So if you come to school, behind, we're going to put you in a lower income school district or poor funded, and then we try and remediate you when you're a junior, senior in high school and right. get you ready. That's probably not the system we would probably draw. Not, no. And then, <laughs> said, okay, you can applaud, that's fine. <laughs> and then we wouldn't say colleges and universities ignore the labor market. Right. So back to the intelligence piece, up and down the, the supply chain, and uh, you've got a great start on it here, and I'm really impressed by that. We're trying to do some of that. Uh, Harper's part of the P20 initiative that uh, NIU's uh, forming in a regional sense with local community colleges and K-12 systems to try and build that pipeline and look at what we can do up and down it. And so I would say look for those regional partnerships with your fellow institutions. So those are my three. Doug, that's really helpful. Thank you. Great insights. Mm -hmm. and I. I love how you introduced the concept of the supply chain or the pipeline. And speaking of the pipeline, tell us what you're doing at K through 12, or tell us importantly what we should be doing as a result of what sure. Dr. Chris. Well, again, I want to just reiterate my colleagues here and thank you to Dr. Ender and Harper College for inviting me here today. It is always very important from the K-12 perspective as a superintendent of schools to understand the bigger picture, whether it be the, your partner community college or the university systems and, and our other uh, institutions where our kids are headed. Because you know our role and responsibility is to make sure they are ready. And that is an ongoing challenge. Um, as Dr. Ender said, Harper had set that out several years ago mm -hmm. to be a target. We've made significant progress, but it's, we're not there yet. And I don't know that you ever arrive. I can tell you whether I'm looking at right. my fifth grade students, my eighth grade students, or my seniors, I don't know that you ever arrive because the target keeps moving. Um, so to you know, address what that readiness looked like, um, and as I listen to the uh, presentation here about the era of change in higher ed, three main areas that I thought were the key, and if you look at that chart there in your booklet on page 21, I think the financial pressure, it's already been reiterated, yeah. uh, you know, is a clear issue we all have to consider moving forward, whether it's the funding side or whether it's the tuition side. Um, private, the increased competition I think that's a reality. And I'll give you a little story in a minute quickly about uh, a K-12 experience I had with charter schools, okay? That's the private sector. 
That's the privatization of education that is going on in this country. I was just last week out in San Diego, National Superintendents Conference, and they, that was a big theme about all uh, public education are going to have to wake up and realize that the privatization of education is on the move, and it is in the higher ed arena as well. Um, and finally, the Knowledge Society. Kids have the world at their fingertips. Right. Whether they're mm -hmm. seventh graders, 10th graders, or college students, they've got the world right there. Uh, I believe the, the number one issue, I think the days of seat time in a building are done. Okay, now, I'm not saying you eliminate it completely. However, I think we have to really think about a blended model uh, with some online opportunities. We are at the K-12 level right now. Um, I look forward to this ongoing partnership with Harper uh, that we're a part of to uh, continue to investigate. I encourage Harper to um, you know, work with us as the feeder schools to uh, take a look at some uh, expanding that dual credit experience to have a team teaching environment have a uh, you know, faculty member at Harper and a faculty member at, at my high school team teach a college level course for our, as a capstone course in science, in English, in math, in the core areas, uh, in a blended online environment. I, I truly believe that's the, the, where we need to head. Um, I think the partnerships um, you know, are, are so critical. We've got the structures in place, now we need to take the next step. And uh, I believe that's so important. We have a generation of learners that will be here very soon at the community college level that have never known life without an iPhone. iPhone come out in 2007, right? 2007. And th there's kids now in our schools, we're seeing it right now in middle school. Five short years from now, they're gonna be right at the doorsteps of higher ed. And are you ready? That's their world. And we're, we're kind of changing the tires, we're going down the road right now in, the, in K-12. And we are adapting and, and looking at opportunities right now at Barrington High School uh, and how we can uh, provide online or blended opportunities for our kids. We've already put in a waiver <laughs> to the State Board of Education to get rid of seat time, the old Carnegie unit yeah. thing. It's not their reality. It's not our reality if we're going to compete with these private companies. I also heard a presentation last week talking about the gamification of education. Yep. That is a real thing that's gone. Tens of millions of dollars are, are the gaming companies are working together with the online private groups and they're making, they're investigating brain research that shows kids can learn at a higher level, engaged in an online activity more than they can sitting in our classrooms in public education, whether it's at higher ed or in K-12. And so I think we have to be part of the solution here, not part of the problem. And we, we've got to realize what's going on all around us and, and make those changes. So um, from my perspective, um, I look forward to that partnership. I hope that that will be one of the targets that comes out of this work over the next couple of days and look forward to continue that partnership. Brian, really thought provoking and we want to follow up on some of those things. Thanks a lot. And we're going to turn now to Elgin Community College. Did I butcher your name? Is it Dr. Sam or Dr. Som? Sam? Oh, good. <laughs> you know, if I got that wrong, I'm off on a really bad list. So tell us again, what are the punching things that came out to you from Dr. Grismer's uh, conversation? What do we need to be taking out of that? Well, let me also thank the uh, friend who invited me back. It means that I wasn't too disruptive. Maybe this time I should be, and then you invite me back because Disruption is what we are talking Disruption's about. Disruption is what it's all about, yes. apparently. Uh, I, I think someone can locate this song. Uh, it's all about the bass. Uh, it's all about the bass. <laughs> it's all about foundation. That's it. Regardless of what we do, at the end of the day, that student who came in had a dream. And if they don't achieve their dream, then it's not completed. And if they don't complete, they can't complete. And that is what we have to keep in the forefront. And after you've been doing it, completion is right and center. And so just continue doing that. The other things we do, they all have that. But completion is absolutely important. And we have to remember that no one group can do it. No one group for this, this country, this society,
to maintain and improve the quality of life. No one group can achieve that. White students, as it was mentioned earlier, cannot do it. So the completion agenda should include people of color, students who are from poor backgrounds, because that is the only way that we can get to the numbers. The second feature of it is, yes, it's good to complete. It is important that we complete. And the question is, at what price? Mm. It leaves these individuals, when they even have the degrees, questioning, did I make the right choice? And it was something who uh, talked about a few minutes ago about the fact that student debt right. is now second to only mortgage. We have to keep that in mind. Make sure that when the students walk off the stage with that piece of paper, they will not be second guessing themselves. <coughs> And then a uh, couple of uh, things I'm, I'm just pulling together. In the college readiness process, we have to look at a couple of areas. Third grade. Third grade reading. We can't wait for the students to get to us. And this is not finger pointing. We have to keep working with K through 12 to make sure that by the time the students leave third grade, they are reading on grade. Because discussion at the college level, whether a person can read at college level, should not even be taking place. So let's focus on that. The same way with mathematics. Let's all push for fourth year high school math. Because that will make a significant major, major contribution towards student success in the long run. Awesome. Thanks so much, folks, and thanks to the whole panel. Jim, I'm going to get you involved in the discussion here. In fact, starting now, if I could. And, and remember, guys, who am I? Yeah, no, I'm the least important person in the room, meaning I want the questions that come from you, but I'm going to start. And Dr. Grismer, you've been attentive, I've noticed, sitting at the head of the class, taking notes or drawing. I don't know which, but nobody can check. But I, I'm going to ask you, you started this thing here, this disruptive conversation. So I'd like to follow up first with you with a, maybe a disruptive question, if I could. You said in your remarks, you, I love it. You said, you know, we have to be bold enough, and you, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, to stop doing some things. I, I, in strategic planning, I always say to people, you have to be willing to start some new things, which means you have to stop doing others, because there aren't enough resources to do it all. And then other things you're doing great, you continue. So you also gave the example of disruptive innovations, like a, 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 a degree that you offer being done in one institution for 7,000, and it, it's offering at UD is 70,000. My question, sir, should UD stop that degree? Now, I don't expect you to answer on behalf of the institution, but I'm trying to exemplify the kinds of questions that might have to happen inside this institution. What would you say? Right. As, as my, my uh, final answer as an employee of the University <laughs> of Denver, uh, <clears throat> I, think, I think it comes back um, right, to the question of value. Um, and uh, each of us, in our own way, saying how can we uh, generate um, value for whom? And so I personally think that there is, there is um, room for um, high tuition private schools uh, like DU and some Northwestern and so many others. Um, but I think it's incumbent on us to be certain that we're generating value that is commensurate with the um, with prices we're charging, mm -hmm. um, and this whole question of, of value, I just think I don't want to uh, harp on it, but I think it is so important. Uh, Doug made a great point, and in our report we talk much more about the loss of public funding um, for institutions. Um, having having managed uh, large organizations. The, the tendency is to say, how will I get the money? 
um, because I've got all these pressures, I've got uh, bills to pay, people to pay. Um, but I think the real question we should say is, whom can I serve? And I think if we change our focus from saying, how do I get the $100,000? And, and, and certainly the $100,000 is important, and I'm not intending to be naive. But I think we have to train ourselves to say, whom can I serve? And in my experience, organizations which are other looking rather than self looking uh, tend to be the most successful. Awesome. Thanks. Let's turn to you guys. And if you have anybody have a question ready? We have microphones floating around. Oh, Jim. Sorry, I didn't see you. Yeah. And then we're going to come I don't know over which here. mic is if on, the one I've got here, the one that's there. I've got one here. Uh, so, uh, Jim, you mentioned markets. Uh, and who do we serve? Um, so I want to raise the issue of adults. We've got a lot of talk here about K-12, and, and some of you may have just seen the op-ed that Chris Cook and I just did in many papers around the state supporting PARC. If you're not for PARC, you're not really for preparing students, in my opinion, for college. Uh, but you could take every baby born in this region and in Illinois generally between now and 2025, which we've set as a goal date for Illinois to reach 60% of its workforce with a high quality college credential. To every baby, whisk them out of the delivery room, right out of their mother's womb, take them to a college going nursery, let their parents visit them on weekends, black, white, brown, every color, make sure every single one of them graduates from high school, goes to college and gets a degree you would be nowhere near 60% by 2025. We don't have enough kids to do it. Now, should we be focused on that? I don't even like to call it a pipeline. I like to call it an interstate, because we've got to have good on and off ramps. We've got to let people accelerate at different speeds. Pipelines are, is a bad image for me, because once you seep out of the pipeline, how do you get back in? Have you ever tried to get back in a pipe after you? It's hard. I try to stay out of pipes. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so the point is, Harper, I would encourage you, in, in, and the data in Illinois is not good. Over the last five years, in a study that ICCB and IBHE and a bunch of us did together looking at trends in higher education over the last five years, we made no progress, I repeat, N-O progress, in getting more adults back to college with a degree. And once you start talking about this market and their needs, you're going to have a conversation about competency-based education. Because these folks don't have time exactly. to waste time in courses they don't need. I totally agree with the seat time piece. I've all, many of you heard me say, if seat time is a proxy, if you're, is your proxy for learning, you're focused on the wrong end of the student. And when these adults come back and these veterans come back with their experiences in learning, if you're not, if you haven't redesigned, and I would say WGU, when I was at Lumina, we gave WGU millions of dollars because we thought that was a great model. Uh, but they're kind of a middle model. They still have courses. I would encourage you to go look at College for America, uh, the University of uh, Southern New Hampshire. They're even more out there. But you, we've got to be willing to meet students that market where it is, give them credit for what they already know, accelerate their progress, and get them out because every adult has a neon sign on their forehead that says, don't waste my time. I've got, I've got things to do and people to support. So new market, I would really hope that Harper would help us in Illinois. Uh, the IBHE has set, one, and obviously the community colleges is, are huge in this, have set as one of its three basic substantive priorities over the next five to seven years, more adults getting back to college and coming out with credentials and degrees that serve them in the workforce. And this is a gaps diversity conversation because the, 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 many of those adults are Hispanic and African American and low income. And 20, one, out of, one out of every five people you cross, you go by on the street, not in this room, but go out in the street and walk, one out of every five people you pass will have gone to college and left with nothing but debt. That's two and four years. So we've gotten some grants recently to help us with this. I invite you, given your capacity and your demonstrated ability to move forward, I really hope Harper will step up and work with us. I know you're already taking a lead on the prior learning assessment work in Illinois. But if we don't tackle this market and serve it well, we might as well close up shop and go home now. Uh, I Great point. Did we get a microphone over to you, sir? Ready to, we all queued up? Go right ahead. 
Uh, my question actually extends that idea. I wanted to follow up with Dr. Harris and have you tell us a little bit more. I'm not sure everyone in the room, me included, is familiar with where you're going with this eliminating the Carnegie unit and focusing on outcomes achievement and less seat time and wherever you're going with that. Could you tell us more about how that looks in your environment so that we can figure out how it might apply here? Well, I want to preface it by saying it's, uh, we're on the cutting edge right now, okay? So we're, but we're, we're starting to break down what those barriers are. The barriers are that. And we that's a state code thing that we have to follow. <laughs> we, here's, here's the deal. Why would we waste kids' time if we know, you know that they had, need flexibility in a schedule in a time like that? There is not necessarily a requirement, in my opinion, to force a kid to sit in a classroom five days a week if they can learn you know, uh, chemistry uh, coming in three days a week, maybe a lab environment, uh, you know, almost that flipped classroom types of situation. If we can hit the target, they can meet the standards. You know, we can verify that they can uh, work to, you know, and they can hit you know those expectations. Why do we have to have them sit there 180 days throughout a calendar year? It, it just is unreasonable. And truthfully, what it is, we're all tied to the ADA, our average daily attendance in K-12. We get our funding based on who sits in the seat six o'clock hours a day. It's crazy. And why can't we go about it a different way? That's the waiver we applied for. It's saying, hey, we don't have to have the attendance. We take attendance every single eight periods a day in our high school, you know, uh, six and a half hours a day. And that's how we get our state funding. The funding miles tied to whether the kid shows up physically sitting in our building. That's what we're getting, what we want to get away from. We can still meet the content standards of that course, whatever it is, Algebra 2, uh, English 1, Mm. whatever the case may be, and, and be able to prove it through data, prove it through the achievement of the students, and, and move them forward and make sure they are college ready. Especially if you're going to blended kinds of models where you're extending the Absolutely. classroom. Right. I'd just I, say I, IBID for higher ed there. The, the Department of Ed is authorizing experimental sites on competency best education. Yes. We're, we're strapped by not ADA, but financial aid policies. It's the same, cha it's very parallel, but we can get beyond this. And so everything you said is exactly applicable to what we ought to be doing in higher ed. 30 seconds, tell the people who don't know about College for America, real quick. Well, Southern New Hampshire University is one of those authorized sites and, and they, uh, they are online, but they, they work, uh, they, they basically they, it's a competency-based curriculum. Uh, WGU has courses, but in every course, they've clearly identified the competencies of that course. So if you're a veteran and you come in and you say, I want to get a BA in some uh, area or AA related to, let's say you've been an air traffic controller and trained in the military, and you have had courses and you've, you, you've actually landed multi-million dollar jets, you can show them what you know and bypass. Exactly. Uh, I, I'll use a teacher, it's just a quick example. I talked to a teacher. She went to traditional places, she, she was a CPA, she wanted to be a teacher, a math teacher in high school. Last I checked, we needed a few good ones of those. And every traditional place told her it was gonna be three to four years and even an in-state tuition was gonna cost her $40,000. She went to Western Governors Association, who, Western Governors University, whose tuition is $6,000 a year and hasn't increased in seven years. She asked them, how long will it take me? And they said, we don't know because we haven't assessed you yet. She got 28 credits her Big first gun. semester in math, because she knew the math better than both high school math teachers, she got to spend her time and money on what she didn't know, which was how to teach math to a group of hormone-driven adolescents. She was out in a year in summer with student teaching at a cost of about $12,000 in a classroom being an effective math teacher in a high school. That's the model we need. Not, not taught here, doesn't count, sit through those classes all over again. Okay, can I get a microphone over here? And we've got a questioner back there. Are you queued up? Go. Thanks, Jim. Hi, full disclosure, uh, I'm with the Fabricators and Manufacturers Association. Good. So my constituency is folks who uh, run manufacturing facilities, job shops. Um, my question is, uh, I have a freshman student in high school. Uh, he loves his CAD engineering class. He loves his wood shop class. <laughs> He's not uh, that time on the seat program. You've got his attention, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> And everybody has age. Where, what is the place for vocational programs and shop programs in high schools? Uh, manufacturers are dying for those skills. We have 600,000 plus jobs unfilled in this country. 
focused in the manufacturing arena because we can't get the right skills set to the right folks for those jobs. So if you could address that. Do you think that's because we've taken those kinds of programs out of high school? Certainly they're not there anymore. I think it comes to you, Brian. Well, I can, I can speak to that. It's because of the academic requirement, the core academic pieces that we're required to do. You can't put 20 pounds of potatoes in a 10 pound bag. So therefore, we have to meet the mandates. That's not mandated. So we, you know, you know, all due respect, if we have to require four years of math in the high school and we have to stick to the old model of the seat time, can't do it. We can, we can never get to those elective environments, whether it be the manufacturing route, the STEM initiative, any of those, uh, you know, strand of courses, fine arts, you know, or, or wherever, you know, the kids want to take those electives. So we need latitude, we need flexibility to be able to do that. Um, we need partnerships too. We need, you know, as I mentioned before, um, you know, I, it's not that the schools want to eliminate those, you know, high schools want to eliminate those. We don't have a choice because we, if we're expected to hit, hit these academic, these math and these English targets that, and, other, and we get graded, it all goes out in eight by 10 glossy on the front page of the Tribune. And if we don't hit that, then we're held accountable for that. We don't get graded on those, unfortunately. So I'd like to see, you know, some relief there to be able to give us some latitude and flexibility to be able to do that. I mean, we've got students, I, I mean, almost 70% of our students are college ready by the time they're sophomores, juniors, and high schools at Barrington High School. I know they are. We know that by the data, um, by the ACT when they take it. We know that at my, at my high school. So therefore, then they give us the opportunity to do some of these other um, uh, things. That's, you know, would be my response. Could, could, Sir, I, could I qualify that though? Because yeah, this, and then we're this vocational come conversation worries me because it's, it's I, I know that's not what you're talking about, but some of this is like back to the 80s, right? right. Where we had kids tracked into vocational 60s. and kids into the real. So the, 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 locking it into courses, I, I, I understand the problem. But if you could integrate rigorous math that is currently being assessed by the new Illinois learning sure. standards into whatever courses. I talked to a group of folks working in a carpentry program and they said, well, you know, we don't do geometry. Mm -hmm. Well, I said, of course you do geometry. You just don't call it that. So if we're really concerned about the math skills that you need and the writing and language and analytic and critical thinking you need to, coming out of high school to have any chance of being a success in college or in a career today, can't possibly, I mean, we, we just have to make sure we can do it in different formats, we can integrate it into different types of courses, we need to focus on the competency, so I, I, I get that. But I, I just worry a little bit with, with a lot of this, let's put Vogue Tech back into the high schools. I get a little worried because I lived through the Votech period in high schools and it was not a pretty picture because I can tell you who was in Votech. I was great in HOMAC. I was <laughs> really good. I think that's where our partnership sits with, with our community colleges. That's where I think we can make that happen. And, and let me add uh, this. Um, we have to remember that it's only not graduating whether high school or college. We have a global competitive world. Right. And I'm excited out there. And to get the first we feel, well, there isn't enough space to put these classes there. That we got it in today's economy. You can have that piece of paper. Yes, though, the employers are picking from anywhere they can pay these students. And when it's done properly, the skills that you need for college will be the skills you need for the career. Okay. All the I'm sorry. I don't mean to stop you. I see two people queued with microphones. Time check. Where's my official time check? We only got a couple minutes left, correct? I got like two minutes after here, right? Okay, so you guys are going to take us home. We'll start here with you. Good. Uh, my name is Brett Fulkerson Smith. I teach philosophy at Harper College. Uh, it's a German name, it means devil's advocate. Uh, so my question is this, um, looming large in this discussion is the idea that uh, what we ought to be doing is providing a meaningful education. That's a very vague term, so I'm listening for answers and it seems like one of the panelists said that a meaningful education is um, in part exemplified by giving the students what they need or giving someone what they need. But my question, and I'll direct it to the panel as a whole, is who uh, who determines what someone needs? And there seems to be three players here. The college, the student, adult or otherwise, or the marketplace. And so I'm curious, uh, who determines that need? 
But another way of asking it is who should take the lead in that conversation? Uh, which of those three entities? Okay, who wants to give me as close to one word answers as you can to his question right down the road? Go All right in. Yeah, All three. Doug. And I, I would add this has been a debate, obviously, for a long time, and the American Association of Colleges and Universities has right. taken this on and over the last 20 years with uh, their liberal education in America's promise standards. And so they talk to employers, they talk to faculty, they talk to students, and they've come up with some great learning outcomes, I think, that are good for college and career that we can all look at. Real quick, yeah. Why do you already be able to prepare the students for the jobs of the future? Because there are many jobs coming out of the pipe that do not exist today, but you need a preparation that is com uh, through the combined priorities will be able to provide for the students. Go ahead, Brian. You started this. Answer the question for the man. Well, I would agree. It is a combination. I mean, it, we all in, in public education are responsive to the society's needs. So we, we are, that's why we're constantly making adjustments. We have to res be responsive to the employers. We have to be responsive to the global market. You know, if kids can read, write, think, and compute, their, their skill set is probably going to be very applicable to any role or responsibility. In. Could, could I just say, the faculty, the faculty should lead this conversation. Uh, when we launched the national, with, with AAC and U, the work at Lumen on the degree qualifications profile, we had teams. They included employers, they included students, they included alumni, they included a variety of entities, and they all need to have their say. But why do we hire the faculty? The faculty should be in the lead on the discussions about the learning outcomes that are necessary. Fair enough. I'm not trying to truncate. I think your question is going to go through a lot of our discussions. Hi. Uh, Jim Gallo. I'm one of the trustees of Harper. I'm also a product of District 211 and uh, have a company in Elk Grove with over 200 employees. So here's my question, and this is uh, probably going to take uh, uh, a series of answers, but in the early 1900s is when high school was no, was, was no longer tuition and high school became free. So now we're in 2014 and 2015 and half of the country doesn't graduate high school. And I think in Illinois, half of the state doesn't, gra the, the kids don't graduate high school. So this administration, this board is hugely sensitive to tuition, but even if we gave tuition free, why do we think that the students are going to go and finish if they're not doing it in high school, and high school is free. If they have no skin in the game. Well, I, first I'll say the, the graduation rate in Illinois high schools is closer to 70-something percent, yeah, so and, it's, and it's, been, it's been going up consistently. I, I, I would yeah. just say when we made high school free in the 20th century, I, there's a great book called Education and Technology that looks by two very distinguished Nobel-winning economists that said, why was the 20th century the American century? And a lot of people point to technology, it was important. But the reason it was the American century was because we invested in education. One of the first things we did is we were a country, unlike many around the world, who said high school is now mandatory and free. That was a huge leap forward for the United States. And then in higher ed, we did the GI Bill. We practically funded the formation of the community college systems in the 60s. So the reason, the it's a great economic, it, it's got table, but it is well reviewed. That's why the 20th century is U.S. century. If we don't make that investment, per Doug's point, in the 21st century, I can guarantee you the 21st century will not be the American Okay, century. I'm long. So, so every, I want everybody to be able to respond, but please keep it short. Can that? Uh, we, we, at the post-secondary level, community colleges, uh, you know, I'm going to get back to this gentleman, the, the philosophy of the community colleges, and I'm going to get back to this question. You have to have a plan for the students, and that's what it's going to come down to. We've gone through this with veterans. And, and I know Harper has a number of veterans who have come. If tuition is completely free, they shop around for classes. And they don't really have a plan because they're not sure what they want to do. And so and it's not costing them anything. And so we've seen a lot of veterans, if you look at the data, they don't complete because they didn't know what they wanted to do and they're struggling with life issues, et cetera. One of the things we looked at at the federal level has been through things like financial aid, ability to benefit, is you have to have those students in a career pathway or a plan program so they know what the beginning and the end is. We have to be able to have offer on and off ramps for that because people are going to change their mind, they're going to uh, have life issues come up, 
but they can't just go blindly into courses because that's exacerbated when the cost is low or when the cost is low. Don't want to be rude. I've got 20 seconds for somebody who wants to say something. Just to answer your question quickly, when high schools were started 100 years ago, they were developed a rank and sort, bell curve, rank and sort. That was their purpose. That's changed in the last 15 years. Now, our expectation is not to rank and sort and divide. Our purpose is to make all kids college ready or career ready. That's a huge shift in the purpose. That's why you're seeing our graduation rates trick, you know, heading up. It's different. Listen, I, want, I wish we had more time. That was a rich conversation. Thanks for those of you who got into it. Rick, do you want, Rick, you want to just get a last comment from I uh, was Dr. gonna turn thank to him you. right now. Okay. Dr. Grismer, I wanted to thank you. Would you like to close the panel with a comment or two? I would, I would only like to thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, this is a most impressive undertaking and I wish you well. Well, thank you, thank and you. join me in thanking the panel and Dr. Grisman for getting us off to a great start. Thank, thank you, guys. Yeah. Okay, so we have now had the good doctor really get the juices flowing in the room, and this panel now reacting and bringing it down to our market level, to Harper's focus level. All right, what I want to do now is I'm going to bring Ken, the president, back up. Ken Ender's going to talk to us for about 15 minutes on the changing Sorry. student demographic, the market, the student profile at Harper. Mm -hmm. in, in bringing Ken up, I want to remind people, brakes are outside, there's a brake station outside. However, he'll kill me if everybody gets up and goes to break while he's speaking. Okay. So please pace yourselves. Ken Ender, it's the floor is back to you. Thank you so much, guys.